Without further ado, we're over to Tom Grimble of Dyson, who's going to be talking about low-cost sensor networks for spatiotemporal analysis of indoor air quality. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, John. Very good to be here. Good to see everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to be presenting some work. Sorry, can you see this in the way? Here at the moment, I'm just trying to check this is... I can see your whole screen. Okay, I just want to to get rid of this. Um... There's no obstruction for us, Tom. Yeah, I, okay, I think excellent. it doesn't right. actually show us that. Yep. Good. It's, it's, um... That. All right, I'm uh, very happy to be here to today, present some work on behalf of myself and some co-authors at the University of Bristol. So this, um, this work was to try and study what we can get from not just one sensor in a house, but multiple sensors all, connect, all interconnected together in a residential property to understand put, about putting an extra dimension on indoor air quality. So this is a um, collaboration between the Computer Science Department at Bristol with uh, Chris Southgate, Dan Sheen, as well as um, the aerosol science group uh, represented by Brian. Um, so yeah, I hope to be able to show you what would happen if you put a, a whole load of aerosol scientists in your kitchen here on the, on the, on the picture there. Okay, is it coming? All right, so indoor air. Um, hopefully everyone understands why it's important. Um, we mostly measure outdoor air with the sensor networks that are reported around the world but at the moment especially we're spending a lot of our time indoors and it's very important to us at Dyson um, with our purifier products uh, understanding what the air is in the home and how we can best um, handle uh, purification and handle the particular pollutants that are present so um, there's many the house itself is a very complex micro environment with many different sources in different rooms and today we just want to talk about we're going to really focus on the kitchen cooking particulates some of these really high concentration events and the particulates measured out of there so i've been keeping myself busy during lockdown in particular uh, measure my own indoor air quality so i put that up here just as an illustration of what the indoor air quality time series really looks like you've got these really strong event peaks um, across the across the whole time time window and then these typically are very short-lived you know less hours or less in duration and then uh, compared to the very long um, times of decay for general outdoor air quality and what's transmitting indoor and outdoor so we've got these very strong indoor events as well as what's transported from the outdoors to indoors and then the, in, the balance between the two um, so if we zoom in on one of those events and this is a, a case we did from from this set of the study we're going to be talking about today where we, we toasted some bread so you've got a four minute toasting period and we're measuring this with an APS and measuring the PM 2.5 contribution you get this very strong peak and decay so usually these these events are very short-lived when, when you when while you're actually doing an activity and then you reserve the decay and um, particularly for purifiers this is a very important um, performance metric that we would um, Typically, typically measure measure looking at that decay rate and understanding how it changes. So what I really want to talk about today is the time scales for pollution changes, those peak values, that decay rate, and then also digging into that extra dimension of property and size changes and see if we can actually pull out some information with, better, with the sensors that we've got. What we're not going to talk about and what I really want to get to, into is human exposure and understanding kind of the statistics and the occupancy um, of the of the system so we're look, just looking at one event one model event and not how many events happen in a day and what people are doing in their houses so slight distinction there in terms of the, the focus so um there's a very large range of um aerosol measurement instruments out there as i'm sure we know and we've got plenty of um of the distributors represented today in the in the audience so you can go for we, we typically, most of us will deal with these one-off specialist instruments. We only have a handful of those. But as we go to the lower cost range, the, the numbers start, to, the, the, the capability of having larger numbers starts to creep up. Um, we're today going to be using the AlphaSense OPCM3, which was talked about by another speaker earlier today. Um, and, but as well, our purifiers that we sell have low-cost PM2.5 sensors in them. Um, and these are also reporting air quality. But with the, the cost and the scales, you're having different levels of fidelity in those measurements. So 
we instrumented up the um, a house that's part of the University of Bristol. It's um, known as the, the Sphere Project. So it's a residential uh, property that is used as a laboratory space there um, for um, data and connectivity kind of projects. Um, and this is part of a, um, a project, um, a master's project running at Bristol that we got involved in and um, tried to support. Um, so basically the key thing is we put together these, um, the AlphaSense OPC, so this is primarily done by Bristol, um, with Raspberry Pis, some basic code, and then you've got an entire um, architecture of um, cloud data and uh, streaming services to allow all of that data network, all those individual sensors to ro report remotely and to work independently so that we can build a very flexible and adaptable network that we can deploy around a space quickly. So this is where the computer science came in to try and understand, to look at how these sensors could be practically used as well as the aerosol science of what we're actually measuring. On top of those low cost sensors, we had a, a whole spectrum of um, instruments, including multiple optical sensors, looking at the microparticle range, LAS, APS, uh, OPS, but we also Pulled pull together some um, nanoparticle instruments. So we had a scanning SMPS and a spare CPC running on just running overall counts. And as well at the end, we just talked a little bit about um, electric charge. We took some measurements in that space, looking at um, the, the charge behavior, some of the aerosols in this measurement. Um, I've included there all the sample periods for those measurements. So you know what kind of um, sample rate we're looking at. And then therefore that's gonna influence the confidence in those particular measurements. So looking at the space, hopefully you can see that um, got a, uh, it's a two story terraced house. And we started off with a number of calibration events, um, focusing on one single room, the kitchen, creating events in there, trying different sources, understanding what the different part particular emissions were like from those different sources. This was then followed by distributing the whole network around the house and we really centered here on the one source, this toast source because of the repeatability and control we can actually generate it with. So it's simple and easy and it's representative of what people do on many occasions. Um, so we also dotted multiple instruments around the house and those that was um, useful for having these extra ground truths and uh, reference data points at different places. Main, main focus was on the high, re high resolution instruments in the kitchen, but then we had additional reference points in other rooms of the house. So just showing um, what a calibration event looks like. So if you start off with all the sensors, you've got 30 AlphaSense OPCs in a single room here. And if you compare the APS measurement, which is the, the line and the dotted line there, you've got this initial mixing phase where you've got the room is not well mixed and not everything is reading the same thing. And that's, that's about a five minute time period in order to get that room mixed. But then after that, you can start looking at the steady decay and then start taking correlations between the two, assuming that that room, that they are, they are reading the same thing. Of course, we do the same for multiple different size classes, PM2.5, PM10, but with short time period windows here of 10 seconds, we're not very confident in the, um, the accuracy of those PM10 measurements. So I would not, not going to consider them much longer. And then looking at the whole... Um, population of sensors, we did see with the calibration that we're getting a couple of instruments that were not reading, um, had, had significant factors out, maybe by a factor of 50%. And we looked at investigating what were specific um, cases of why those were and checking those instruments. So having this um, calibration was very useful to make sure the network was all reporting before we started looking at multiple rooms and seeing the differences between them. And just in terms of correlation, just simple linear fit models at the moment were being applied in this case, just to get um, correlation factors between the two. Um, so nothing much more complicated than that. And, but only looking at finite windows of um, concentration, looking at high resolution measurement, high, high concentration measurements and low concentration measurements. So this is just one example of a low concentration measurement here being, being captured. So that's some of that calibration, but I wanna talk a bit more about the temporal events. So if we've got a source in the kitchen, and then two sensors in blue and orange there um, at different points in the house, very close to the source and very far from the source. You get these two very different traces. You've got the sharp peak and uh, then, then decay. So it's the initial detection of when those particulates are found by those sensors from a threshold measurement is different. That's because of the transport times, but also we've got the maximum points and the shape of the curve is significantly different. But as we see, as we switch towards an hour time scale, we are getting these tending towards the same decay behavior. So showing that the time scale for the whole house to mixing is towards the scale of an hour rather than 
that five minutes for a single room. As well, looking at that decay, it's not just one decay, there's multiple different decay contributions. And um, a simple breakdown shown here is looking at that initial transient expansion um, and then a steady decay uh, being modeled with a double exponential sum here, double exponential decay curve there. And so these can be, with a clean and uh, high, high signal to noise event like this, we can easily fit multiple exponential decays to that curve. So we're going to look at a, a, a range of different time scales on there. Um, so we start off with um, the detection time and look at that across different rooms. So here's the PM 2.5 values and we see there's quite a range up to 10, 15 minutes for certain rooms to transport um, from the kitchen to the house. You know, we're talking about 10 meters here of transport to make a measurable detection on a different sensor. But we can also do that by different size classes and using the, um, the size bins available on those OPC and freeze. We've done it for PM1 and then the first four size classes in the uh, number distribution channels. Um, the main reason there is just because those are the, high, the, the most significant signal to noise and beyond this that your signal to noise drops below any meaningful um, measurement here. Um, we can also look then at the, um, the size, the, the width of the peak in time. So trying to keep everything in a time measurement here. Um, so the width of the peak shows how sharp that rise and fall is and we see very strong size dependent behavior in terms of the smallest sizes have the widest peaks and are residing in the rooms longest. And then finally looking at long-term decay behavior and again we get see consistent size dependent decay across the whole um, size band. Um, which actually is mirrored in almost every room. So that, that behavior, once the whole house is mixed, um, seems to be um, not zone, zone dependent, whereas those other short-term behaviors are zone, very zone dependent. So what does this let us do? So we've looked at one particular event, but now we can compare multiple events. So allow me to just run through this. So we're gonna compare a case where there was no ventilation, all the windows and doors closed on the left, against a case where all the windows and doors were open. And you can see on the top there, if we scan through this, which sensors light up in the house as the um, pollution moves. So we see initially on the left there, strong vertical motion. So there's top sensors in the room are uh, being lit up first and then it moves up the stairs into the upstairs floor, but that's before it reaches any of the rooms on the ground floor. If you look at the living room there, it takes a very long time for it to gradually slowly build up decay. Whereas on the, light, the, on the right, we see a very quick, build, decay, and then pulse because the whole house is open and we get a very clean, quick air movements that flush away the pollutants away from the location. So looking at in terms of a decay time, so time to reach the half of the maximum concentration, um, we can look at the different rooms across the house to see they have different decay times. I want to draw your attention there to the living room and dining room. So I said all the doors and windows are open. I actually was misspoke there. Um, the windows and the windows in those rooms could not be open, so they were limited to just the doorway frame, and therefore they had a lower um, air transfer rate uh, trying to clean that room, and therefore you see corresponding not quite such a large decrease in the decay time, decay time to be um, still about 10 minutes to get those rooms clean. So finally, just uh, uh, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the nanoparticle environment. So all the measurements here we'll be doing with optical particle sensors. We've got that threshold around 300 nanometers, which we can measure, but we did include nanoparticle measurements because there's a lot of interesting domain when you go sub 300 nanometers there. And here you can see uh, the decay, decay rate, decay curves for successive SMPS scans and then time synchronized that and join that with the APS measurement. And there's definitely some interesting decay behavior there um, looking towards the, the, the nanoparticle 100 nanometers and below. So um, definitely some opportunities with higher time resolution to start looking at those decay curves. Um, so to actually get over that, that time resolution limitation that we had, we actually had a, a separate CPC and APS, CPC and electrometer running and look at those concentration measurements. So you've got the APS, CPC and electrometer there being all simultaneously sampled. And you can see where the CPC in particular has a much quicker um, rise over compared to the APS. So the nanoparticles are generated sooner than the microparticles, which was pretty much be expected in a, in a toasting situation. We can then look at the ratio of those measurements and also look at the charge per particle estimation based on the CPC and electrometer results. And we see this when, when these behaviors peak, 
and then how they decay over time. So you've got this pretty consistent decay curve for the charged particle, um, which is interesting and something we'd quite like to look into more. So I'll just finish on that, just a whistle stops tour of a few aspects of indoor air quality, trying to put that time and 3D spatial resolution on the system. Um, we can see some size dependent time evolution and that, so not just, we don't want to just report single mass classes like PM 2.5, we want to actually look a little bit more into how size dependence um, evolves. We also ha have these very non-isotropic convection behaviors. So this was a hot day in the middle of July in 2019. So we had very strong uh, thermal, thermal um, currents of plumes moving the particulates around. So we're seeing vertical behavior before horizontal behavior. Um, but also I just want to highlight the, there's really useful uh, cross collaborations here between computer science and the aerosol science community here for the, the data infrastructure, because there's a huge interest at the moment in expanding the numbers of sensors that are available in the world to make these measurements. And um, we need the infrastructures in place there to be able to use those tools reliably and um, effectively in the future as those numbers of sensors available become greater. So thank you very much and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand by clicking on participants. Uh, and then at the list at the bottom of participants, just click raise hand. Um, we've got time for one or two questions, if anyone's got to say anything. Um, okay, I don't see anything, so we may as well press on so we can get down the pub earlier. Oh, wait, actually, we can't. Um, Okay, thanks very much indeed, Tom. Thank you very much, everyone.